ciclo di tre lezioni del collega Patrick Simoncic che, che viene da Varsavia, dall'Istituto dall per le ricerche letterarie dell'Accademia delle Scienze, Polacca. Eh, eh, il Piotr Simoncic è uno specialista, è il massimo specialista polacco in quanto di Pure Stalis è un esperto di letteratura polacca contemporanea, ha dedicato i nostri studi fotografici al poeta e cosatore di Luca Roscesti, di cui parlerà però domani. Domani nel contesto della, delle, delle lezioni del corso di letteratura polacca, se a qualcuno interessasse sapere qualcosa di più di questo poeta, domani alle 12.30 a, a, a partecipare alla, alla, alla lezione del professor Sorocci. Eh, tra l'altro è stata sua l'idea di dedicare a Rio Gorosevsky una, una rivista, è uno dei due scrittori polacchi a cui è, solo, è dedicato il periodo che esce, che esce annualmente. E, Uh, 
so now we also um, might say that we are uh, celebrating it abroad, <laughs> okay, with a good occasion, which is the, the publication of that book. Um, so this is uh, how how this is related. Uh, we will start with something fresh, and then we will move to the classics um, uh, with Bieloszewski. And also, um, if any of you does um, or is interested in translation studies, I'm not only going to be talking about Bieloszewski, but actually I have my own translations to English of his Gothic stories, um, like. Not, not exactly ghost stories, but something of this kind, which is a postmodern version of, uh, of Gothic literature, uh, something that is um, not really known um, um, uh, in the world, uh, and Polish uh, Gothic is not very famous in the world. And it's a marginal trend in Polish literature, but Bielczewski tried that. Um, these stories are short, uh, so I prepared translations for the journal Polish Gothic, which I call RAM. Co edit with a um, Polish famous lesbian uh, feminist uh, writer Izabela Morska, um, who will be mentioned today uh, in, in the lecture. Uh, so we have this uh, journal, and uh, there's going to be a presentation of these three short stories, but this is going to be a premiere uh, tomorrow, so, so nobody knows them, not even a proofreader. <laughs> Um, you, you, you can feel free tomorrow to correct if you find any mistakes, grammar mistakes and style mistakes. Uh, we can discuss that. If there are the, there's a significant number of uh, Polish speaking students tomorrow, we can also take a look at the Polish originals and, uh, and, and compare them and have a discussion about that. How did, uh, how did they do, okay? <laughs> uh, but it's not, uh, it's not everything that is going to be about Bielczewski. There, there, uh, there's going to be a more general introduction. I also took a file with my translations uh, of poems uh, of Bielczewski, which I uh, did once for the students uh, of my course uh, at Jagiellonian University. I, for years, I had a course before pandemic. I had a course called uh, Polish Bia Literature and Social Change at Jagiellonian University. And um, um, a few years ago, uh, inedited poems by Bielczewski uh, were published uh, years after his death uh, with significant homoerotic content. Um, so I decided I must talk about it uh, with my students and therefore I translated some of them. Um, I don't know how, how successfully, but, uh, but, but otherwise they, they would not be available. Uh, so, so, so I have this, uh, the, the, these translations and uh, we can discuss them if there's time um, tomorrow. And now the connection of today's, this, this lecture with uh, the other one. Uh, so <laughs> it's going to be connected this way. Now I will be talking more about literature and its social implications uh, as, um, as it developed from the 80s more or less. Um, and uh, in the evening, I will discuss rather uh, scholarship, a literary scholarship, queer literary scholarship, which is uh, quite abundant in, in Poland, and um, it has its authors, not only myself, and so, so I will talk about, I will try not to talk too much about myself, although my narcissistic tendencies uh, usually lead me to <laughs> showcasing myself. Um, um, uh, before anyone. Uh, but anyway, so, 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 so that's it. And um, uh, I will try not to make this uh, lecture names, 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 because I imagine that uh, for those of you who might not be very familiar with Polish literature or even Polish language, if I uh, speak name after name after name after name and then the titles of the novels is going to be uh, some, somehow. Um, Unsupportable, uh, hard to understand, hard to follow. So, so I, I, I try to talk about problems, maybe <laughs> problems, issues, concepts, uh, which we, which we, we uh, experienced. So, as, as I said, I'll start in the 80s, and um, before the 80s, uh, so from the let's say birth of modernism, also in Poland in the late 19th century. Till the 70s, we had uh, instances of queer literature in uh, um, in Poland, uh, but they followed a, 
specific code uh, usually usually of um, not being expressible, of not being um, of, of not being direct. They were metaphorical. Uh, they were using the code of sublimation. Sublimation meaning um, if you really need to talk about this, these dirty low things <laughs> such as sexual life, then you have to kind of uh, pay a tribute to the higher part of the body, to the mind. Uh, so so, so uh, our literature, queer literature from the early modernist phase to late modernism is usually about artists or people who, uh, painters, uh, writers, etc. etc. Um, or if not, uh, it's about degenerates. <laughs> so so you, you had an option to be uh, either an artist uh, or an intellectual or a professor, either, either a, a degenerate who, for instance, is a main prostitute and sells on, on, on streets and on squares, on cruising places, etc. Et um, but basically, uh, there, there, were, there was quite a lot uh, of um, uh, such literature and uh, of writers. I won't be uh, mentioning many names because it, 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 is, it is pointless, it, it's hundreds of names. <laughs> I would like to suggest uh, that uh, there is a still debate and uh, we don't know how to solve it, really. Um, the debate is, uh, did modernism enable people to express sexual, uh, sexuality and homosexuality included um, overtly? Or was it that just uh, for some reason in the 20th century there were more gay people in the world. Obviously, <laughs> obviously uh, the, 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 the former, um, the, la the latter idea seems, uh, seems weird, right? And I'm thinking that um, it's not the first period in history actually when many uh, queer people became visible. And knowing that I'm in Italy, obviously, uh, you can think of Italian uh, Renaissance and, 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 and painters, okay? So many painters, uh, Caravaggio, Bonarotti, uh, Giovanni, Sodoma, etc., etc., uh, all of them. So they, like, it seems like, like the whole Renaissance and Mannerism was created by queer people. Almost. Botticelli. Um, uh, so, so was it the product of be, uh, being more and more queer people in the world? Or rather, that some periods, some politics, some tendencies, cultural tendencies, allow queer expression more freely. So I opt for the, for the latter. That it is uh, also modernism that allowed people to express sexuality, not only homosexuality, uh, um, uh, more freely. With its restrictions and limitations. So uh, that was the code, uh, not only in Polish literature, but also in Polish literature. If you compare it to, uh, for instance, Marcel Proust, um, uh, homosexuality in Proust is evident, and yet it is coded. Because, why? Because, because Proust doesn't come out in, in, in his novel. He moves uh, uh, homosexual tendencies to other male characters and to female characters, Albertina, uh, who's a, a girlfriend of the narrator, apparently is a lesbian. Um, and as, 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 as uh, so, so there, there's a rumor that, that Albertina is actually Albert, who, who was Proust's, the Proust's driver, <laughs> etc. Et so this is the code. And in Polish literature, we also use this very much. We have uh, quite uh, a lot of stories, especially by you know, Sofie Vaskiewicz, when um, there's, a, there's a story which is translated to Italian, I'm sure, because my students talked about it in the exam. And there's a movie made by Andrzej Varda, the, the movie version is completely straight. Um, it's called uh, Andes Vilka. Uh, how, uh, how is it translated, Signorina Signor, 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 Um So it's a story about a 40 years old guy coming to a place where he was a professor of a few girls, sisters, uh, coming uh, after years to see what happened with them. And they see what happened with him. He's not a war experience, etc. Um, so he was in love with and had sex with all of them. So um, the, the study by uh, a Swiss 
uh, Slavic scholar Gernot Ritz that I will be talking in, uh, today, but later in, uh, in, in, in my second class, um, shows, uh, and that was a known fact, but not discussed, that uh, actually Vashkevich meant a family um, who had a few sons. They had five or six sons. Did Ivashkevich indeed seduce uh, all of them? I don't know, but, but, basically, but basically that's the concept. Uh, gender was changed, okay? Still the story has something that if you know how to read it, and the concept here uh, I used a lot in my research, comes from Italian, I borrowed it, I think I borrowed it from Fabio Pleto, who is a specialist from Bergamo, a specialist from Camp. Uh, he used the concept uh, that Kant is for conoscenti, and there is also the ignoranti. Uh, those who, uh, who, who see the same text, ignoranti, but don't understand the subtext of it, okay? And the conoscenti are those who can read it double way, okay? There are uh, two ways of reading something. You can read it straightforward, uh, you, can, you can read it as a straight text, and then if you're conoscenti, you know, you, you know that by some expressions, by some lines, traces, uh, you, you can understand the same text as uh, talking about yourself, about your queer experience. So this is more or less the poetics of unexpressible uh, desire uh, in this case. Uh, and this is the poetics that changed uh, in Polish literature. Well, in, in the 70s I would say, uh, but, uh, but the book I, I'm thinking about right now was not published until the 80s. So come the 80s, okay? And uh, in the 80s, uh, Poland was still under communism until 1989. Um, but there was a new thing, new, thing, new phenomenon, the uh, popular uh, workers' movement Solidarność, Solidarity, uh, which uh, tried to... Well, actually they did not, uh, at first, uh, the, the idea was not to fight and change the system so much as to make it more human. But it, it eventually meant they discovered that you, 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 you just can't um, change the system, okay? It's unchangeable, so, um, so they had to fight it. Um, but with, 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 with Solidarity Movement showing, uh, Solidarity connected itself pretty much to church. Uh, church supported it. Because church was, uh, uh, Catholic Church in Poland was also persecuted by communists. They had their deals in some ways, but um, Priests were um, investigated, they were followed by secret service, etc., etc. They were forced to become spies of the secret service, etc., etc. Not only priests, almost everyone under the paranoid construction of uh, real socialism um, uh, in, in most of the countries from this so called Soviet bloc. But uh, basically, the church had no interest in supporting uh, the system. So, so when there, was, there were new tendencies, rebel tendencies, they supported th these tendencies. This uh, created uh, a specific uh, situation also for queer people, because the new movement, Solidarity Movement, apparently and overtly talked about the concept of human rights. However, as you can imagine, due to the connection to the Catholic Church, these human rights did not include a uh, female right to abort, but by the way, the communist states uh, obviously um, followed the portal, it, it, it was legal, so, so that was not the issue. Uh, the concept of uh, human rights did not either involve any expression of homosexuality. Um, and throughout the 80s, the whole solidarity movement became more and more um, conservative, actually, and more and more religious. This conflict, which derives from the 80s in Poland, that, that you had, um, uh, let's say, the left that was not uh, also in, uh, either interested uh, in supporting nascent uh, queer movements, no, uh, nor the other uh, current, the Catholic current, uh, created a situation where for queer people there was no place for expression, in a way. One of the answers to, uh, to that uh, we find in Miron Białczewski's secret diary when he goes to the US. There is a long paragraph, uh, uh, pages, pages. I discussed that uh, also in my essay which was published in Italy. Uh, in the revista pl.it 
co-edit, lead co-edited by Luca Bernardini and Alessandra Menta, who will be also discussed in the second lecture today. Amenta, because it's important um, uh, in this context. So, so, so they run this, and I uh, sent them a paper in English. If, if you're interested, you can read it. I, I was talking about the, the searching for, for a third way. Bielowski uh, was invited by uh, a Polish American foundation, which is anti communist, but the communist uh, authorities allowed him to go. Uh, I don't know if you know about that. I mean, I, I, I assume that you should, <laughs> but um, um, you know, in, under communism, you, you just you couldn't just quit the country like, like that, okay? Because you didn't have a passport, you had to apply for a passport to go out. So um, you could, and, and there were denials. Bielowski also was also denied a uh, passport a few times uh, earlier in the, in the past. It depended on uh, if um, the authorities saw an interest actually. Um, for instance captivating a writer to become the Secret Service agent or a spy. Uh, basically, um, um, most of the people, also uh, scholars from the university, some of our college, college uh, colleagues were outed as uh, agents after years um, because they wanted to go on a scholarship. But then they had this um, unpleasant meeting with the Secret Service agent who was convincing them to um, discuss what, whom they met, what they talked about, etc. etc. And that's, of course, that was filed. Um, so, Bielczewski uh, was not that case. He was not, uh, um, I mean, he was uh, constantly visiting Secret Service, but he never broke, okay? Um, neither in this case. However, when he goes to the US, he, he shows that um, he has to do something with his visa in the Polish embassy. In front of the Polish embassy, due to the martial law and uh, solidarity movement, there is an anti-communist manifestation. He has to enter the building to validate his visa, but he was invited by an anti-communist organization. Okay? So he feels like one leg here, one leg here, and he finally decides, I don't really belong either here, either here. I'll go to a porno shop, to porn cinemas. Okay? And this seems to be like his and he's 60 when he's doing that, so it's, it's uh, one year, uh, half year before he dies. So, so his answer uh, to that is porn, okay? Porn, sex, sexual life, uh, finally sexual expression of that. And this is something that, that is unique and this journal was published only in 2012. He made a, in his last will, he made a remark, it must be, it can't be published until 2010. He died in 1983. Uh, so, so it waited years and we didn't know about that, but he had this idea that uh, neither this part, neither this part can offer anything for me and I spent 60 years uh, in communism uh, and living my way and I wouldn't say that unhappily, but, um, but I, can, I, I see a way of expression. So th this way of expression he saw in, uh, in the US of early 80s, pre-HIV, pre-AIDS, I mean, that was actually the beginning of the pandemic, but he, he didn't know about that, probably. Not, not, it was not discussed. Um, so he experienced this uh, life pre-pandemic, okay, like, like with, with saunas, with, uh, with porn cinemas, etc., cruising places and uh, porn shops. Uh, and that seemed to be his uh, answer, that that's what, what, what is needed for our people, okay, so, so um, between church and communism, sex. <laughs> um, but that was not um, everything. We had also another writer. Uh, the name is Richard Marek For you, it doesn't matter, okay? He wrote uh, a, a drama called Ciepły Brat, which would be the word brother. If any of you speak German or Czech, you would know. Uh, it, also in Polish it existed, but it's, a, uh, it, it's copied from a German language. A warm brother was an expression uh, meaning a faggot. Um, so, 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 uh, and it was offensive um, in a way. Or you could say just the warm guys, the warm guys, chip. Which uh, I don't know, it, it doesn't speak about the temperature of the body, by the way, I'm very warm right now. I think I'm taking off my jacket. But, um, but, but I don't know, like, like you're too warm towards other men, I suppose. You, you know, you're, you're, um, you, you don't show your cool. 
want to, with every gesture, with every gesture, try to seduce men, right? Uh, and men should be uh, made from steel, right? <laughs> um, towards other men. Uh, so, so I think this is it. Um, so basically, in that play, he sh uh, he's uh, discussing um, a cabaret actor who lives in a couple with, uh, with, with another guy, and this another guy uh, decides to join Solidarity Movement. And, and the, the, the actor from the cabaret tries to make a living uh, and oscillate between um, his need to not belong to communist life and his need to work. If you, want, if you need to work in the television, obviously you, you have to make some concessions, etc. So in the 80s, uh, the dominant um, judgment of actors and people from the arts who did not subscribe to Solidarity Movement was that they are traitors, that they are, um, how could we say, that, 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 that their oscillation is not positive. You have, you have to be either a hero, and, but, but, and this, is how many, uh, how, um, uh, this is how many careers of great actors actually ended. They um, lived a moment when they were supported uh, and uh, showed pretty much by communist television, etc. But after '89, they were never invited uh, to, to, to make movies. Uh, they even had to change theaters from major national theaters to some small theaters uh, in the province, etc., etc. So you know um, this, this dilemma that, that you, you just want to do your thing. Uh, in the 80s was uh, under a uh, huge pressure, ideo ideological pressure, and this ideological pressure was uh, also defined by Christian, uh, Christianity and Catholicism and um, moral, um, severe moral judgments, okay? Which once again uh, showed that there was, there was no third way. So eventually the former lover who joined the Solidarity Movement decides to to, to, to become straight, okay? He goes on a pilgrimage to John Stochowa to 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 Jasna uh, Kura, uh, which is like Claremont, um, um, and, and and this is a, a common practice in Poland that, that people go on pilgrimages to Claremont, just like, like they do to Santiago de Compostela, for instance, you know, uh, something like that. And he joins joins them and uh, decides to. Uh, Become straight. Okay? So, 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 so it, the, the whole play says that you either become <laughs> straight, either you, you have to oscillate between these two powers, but you will never, never win. Okay? You will always lose. You are condemned to lose between them. And this is a situation that marked Polish uh, queer literature for, for years, actually. Now, there is a second phenomenon in the 80s that I would like to discuss without too many names. That is uh, something that is uh, not really discussed, and I, I started talking about that uh, I don't know three or four years ago. But uh, each time I'm uh, more and more convinced. So this phenomenon is uh, something that today uh, we have a word for that. We would call it pink washing. Are you familiar with the concept of pink washing? Or do I have to? Okay, pink washing. Like and white washing. Do you know what it is? Yeah. So or red washing. <laughs> when you try to uh, red, red, white washing is when you when you uh, when you uh, when, when, when you're white and you're using something that is appropriated from black culture, for instance, and, and you uh, try to show yourself as progressive. Okay, same thing can be applied, and it, it is applied. That the concept uh, was first used to, toward Israel uh, of pink washing. So so pink washing is is a situation when. You, uh, you try to show yourself as progressive, so you allow something of a gayest expression, etc. In Israel's uh, uh, context, it was the famous Tel Aviv uh, Gay Pride Parade, or um, their pol politics towards Eurovision contest, uh, which for years they've been sending, say, people who have either a queer appeal or either a queer, starting from transgender to then international in the late 80, 90s, and, and, and then followed by Netta, who also won, and uh, like, like most of uh, the people who, uh, whom they sent, um, if, if, not, uh, if they are not queer, they at least um, make queer show, let's say, okay? <laughs> they have this queer appearance. 
So this fact that it is supposed to show Israel as a very progressive country in order to conceal and hide the fact uh, of what they are doing to Palestine. So um, they, they, they said, we are very progressive. You can't accuse us uh, of being conservative. Right? We don't have um, like right-wing problems in our country. Even if a right-wing government uh, is, is right now ruling the country, we still have gay pride parade, etc. Et uh, they even, uh, Israel even invites uh, queer journalists from all over the world and pays for their hotels, etc. Uh, to come to Tel Aviv uh, Gay Pride. I know because my, uh, one of my friends is a gay writer and also uh, a journalist, a film critic, and was invited uh, to Tel Aviv Parade this way. And then they, uh, they take you and they do something that also um, communist uh, Soviet Union or even Poland did to foreigners from the West. Okay? So uh, also, uh, for instance, uh, in in, in the concentration camp uh, in, Czech, in Czechia, uh, Theresienstadt. It's a famous thing and there's a play about that. So, so the, the idea is that you bring those people and you show us the sanitized version uh, of the concentration camp of the communist state or of the state of Israel, right? As, um, as, 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 as something that uh, we're, we're... Or even if you go to China, for instance, you never see a labor camps. I've been to China, I've never seen them, okay? Um, and you don't see the factories where, where people are forced to work, even children, etc. Et um, as a tourist, okay? You have tourist guides from China and they show you things that they want to show you, okay? You, you never see uh, what's behind the curtain. So, so basically, this is, uh, this is where the concept of pink washing uh, was copied um, from red washing, from white washing, etc. Black washing. Um, now, <clears throat> it seemed to me very strange because we always uh, had this concept that censorship in communist Poland um, was always against. You had, if you wanted to publish something that was queer, you had to, uh, you had to um, play a game with censorship. And in some ways this is true, but in some ways it is not. I found that in, in the early 80s, something happened that could be classified as pink washing. So the authorities, using censorship institution, tried to negotiate with uh, some queer writers. The most um, significant, case, significant case in this context is Jerzy Andrzejewski. This is the guy that I mentioned uh, who, who, who wrote a novel in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, which was full of uh, queer sexual content. And he first tried to publish it um, on exile, but, uh, but, but uh, the Polish authorities were constantly flirting with him. They were saying, if you cut something political, we will allow you to publish this sex scene where, where, where there's a guy who says that uh, to, 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 to his lover's mother that um, your son loves being fucked by my huge dick, etc. Literally. And this scene that, uh, actually went published. Not only, uh, but, but that happened only in 1982. So he was waiting with this novel and playing a double game with the exile publisher and uh, the communist state publisher. And suddenly, when uh, martial law broke in December 1981, something changed in the politics of uh, censorship and also uh, Ministry of Culture. Suddenly, books that were um, for two, three years on the shelf, waiting for publication for, for the final decision, started being published. This is the case with Jerzy Andrzejewski and his novel Palp. Um, this one is, I think, not translated to Italian, it's translated to French and published by Gallimard, because uh, Andrzejewski, at the moment when he was uh, quite famous, um, uh, he, he, he's the one who wrote uh, Ashes and Diamonds, uh, that Andre Veda made a movie version of it, and uh, this movie version was um, awarded in Cannes. So Andrzejewski became quite, uh, quite famous and then was publishing uh, books also in Italy. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of his novels uh, is by some considered one of, you know, let's say, top five best uh, novels of Polish uh, Polish in the 20th century, and it's called The Grammarian um, Gates to Paradise. Uh, the Paradise. Um, great novel, very recommendable. If you, if you want something from, uh, uh, it's about uh, children crusades, okay? And uh, the children that go on those crusades uh, are not really religious, they, all, they, are, they only have sex, but not with people that they love. I'm not saying it anymore. If you're interested, uh, you'll find it. I will just tell you that this, this novel is also avant-garde and it consists of only two sentences. Uh, the last sentence 
uh, appears on the last page of it and, and has several rooms. And, and, and what precedes it is a huge, 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 massive sentence. Uh, but it's readable, okay? Uh, it's translated into Spanish, and my Spanish students were saying that in the beginning, you start uh, reading it and, and you're totally, totally lost. But after a moment, you get the idea how he constructs these uh, complex sentences. And, um, and, and you can follow it. And, and actually, it's so interesting because it's very short uh, that you can do it. So basically, Andrzejewski and his novel Pulp was it seemed to be like it was written as uh, sort of uh, the, the, the biggest commentary on 20th century Poland, okay? where people from mixed backgrounds, uh, mixed political, ethnical, meaning Jewish and uh, Polish um, live in, in one place, people from the exile and local people are mixed in a specific mix uh, that is called that, is, that he calls the pulp, that the condition of Polish um, culture and state of mind is pulp, okay? But pulp obviously is also a postmodern concept. And this novel is very postmodern as well because it is, it is a novel that uh, tells the story of, um, of a marriage and it shows the long process leading to this marriage, but eventually this marriage never happened. Uh, so it's only a, a potential thing. And the novel is surrounded, the, the, the novel parts are surrounded by his journal, which he sort of modeled on André Gide's uh, journal of, I don't know, for Monet is the French title, the people who falsify uh, things, uh, the, the false, uh, falsifiers. <laughs> Okay, so it's so, so one page uh, run a, a diary, but it was published separately. Andrzejewski decided to combine diary and uh, novel. So, 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 for instance, you have a scene from the novel, it cuts, and suddenly he discusses. I have to, with the reader, I have many doubts. Should I, should my hero go that street, or maybe should he should go that street? Well, how should I write it right now? The weather is bad, and I don't, I don't feel I have pretty much energy, so I don't know. Maybe I'll stop it for a moment and see what energy comes back to me in a few days. Things, things like that. So, so you see this novel in the process, right? Um, um, and when I say it was written in the late 60s and 70s, now it's sort of obvious, but, but back then it wasn't. So it, it might seem that it's one of the first, actually, postmodern uh, novels of, of Polish literature. And it becomes published in 1982 with this incriminated uh, sex content, but also politically charged content. This is not the only case. A similar case we have with Grzegorz Musiał. Grzegorz Musiał uh, was born in 1952, so uh, in 1981, uh, when martial law broke, he was uh, about uh, 30, and uh, he was an oculist. Uh, by education and worked in that, but also a writer who managed to publish a book of poems. And he had two novels. Uh, one was called uh, Stampulne, which would be like the liquid state, meaning something, as you can imagine, like the liquid con condition of postmodern existence, <laughs> um, or the liquid condition of queer people and their camp uh, uh, aesthetics, because the novel is camp. And uh, his second novel was called uh, Czeska Bijuteria, Czech uh, Jewelry. And uh, under communism, Czech Jewelry was something that. Uh, the, okay, the, the Soviet uh, bloc was rather not very rich, okay? But people still wanted to have beautiful things. So in Czech, uh, in Czechoslovakia, they, they uh, produced uh, plastic and other artificial things that imitated jewelry, like, like real jewelry, okay? Um, so, so his uh, second novel was uh, supposed to mm, discuss the fakeness of uh, existence under communism, the fakeness of its aesthetic, but also the fakeness that you, uh, you live when, uh, when you're a queer person. Um, and these uh, two novels were not allowed, mm, and that was because of the fact that uh, Grzegorz Musiał studied uh, uh, at the uh, Medical University in Gdańsk, and Gdańsk by the sea, by the Baltic Sea, is the, is the place where Solidarity Movement was born. And he joined it uh, instantly. But, uh, but he experienced um, that even though in the 70s he seemed to have an open queer student life, and he was even allowed to go abroad to, 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 to the UK and to some other countries where he had family and friends, uh, so he 
individual the Western queer life styles um, and tried to live in Poland uh, in the 70s as, uh, as if there were no limitations neither. Uh, and this, uh, described that in these novels written in the late 70s and they were blocked by the censorship for some years. However, the martial law breaks, Grzegorz uh, Musiał is a member of Solidarity Movement, and suddenly he receives a call, we might publish your novel, not in the um, publishing house that you wanted, the most prestigious in the country, but in a local one. Still, if you don't, uh, if you don't agree, we don't know when uh, this novel will be able to be published uh, again. Okay? So what do you do? This is martial law. <laughs> um, people didn't know that martial law is going to to last so long, and they didn't know that the communism is going to fall in uh, seven years, which is a, a, a long period actually, a very sad period for, 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 for Poland. But back then, uh, Luca will tell you some things about that because he visited, he visited Poland in 1983, 82, right? So, uh, if you're interested, uh, ask him um, what, 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 what it was like. Um, but basically, uh, he accepted this offer. But he also ran a sort of a secret diary uh, called Dzień Wojny Polska Józelskie, Journal of, uh, mm, of the War of Poland against Wojciech Józelski. Wojciech Józelski was the general uh, who, um, who was the chief of the government, the communist government, and the, the guy who introduced the martial law. Uh, so the implication of the title is that uh, if you're for Communist politics, you are not Polish. This is a very com common uh, understanding, um, um, common concept in, in, in Polish culture. But like, if you don't like uh, somebody's views, you, call, uh, you exclude them from the Polish community, right? This is uh, happening right now pretty much with uh, right wing government. If you um, if you're not Catholic, you're not Polish, etc., uh, etc. Et this kind of construction. Uh, if you want uh, uh, Belarus, uh, like, like um, Syrian um, uh, uh, exiled people to uh, come through Belarusian border, you're not Polish, etc. Yeah. You see what I mean? It's like a stupid tool, but uh, simple minds sort of uh, accept it. Because the right wing government speaks uh, mostly to simple minds. Um, but uh, basically, so, so this this is uh, this began in the 80s, as I, as, I, as I said. But this journal was published only in 2005, when Grzegorz Musiał uh, was already not the progressive uh, queer campy boy of the past, but he became a right-wing intellectual who wants to uh, and, 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 and a Catholic intellectual who wants to join. Um, um, Catholicism with his expression of homosexuality, which is a unique position in, in Polish contemporary queer literature, but he wouldn't say that he's a um, part of queer literature either. So, uh, so, so he, he, would, he would say that um, he, uh, he has homosexual tendencies, maybe, uh, or something like that, but, but it, not that he's a queer writer. But anyway, so this journal shows uh, in many ways how uh, Solidarity Movement. Um, was conscious that some of its members were queer and that uh, it potentially could lead to blackmailability. You, you, know, you know what I mean? Like you're uh, arrested by the secret office, and the secret office always knew if somebody was queer. I'm going to talk about it in a moment. Um, you're arrested. And, and, and you have, you're, you're gay, you have a gay life, you even have a boyfriend, but you also have a wife, and you have a work. And uh, so, so the, the conversation goes, um, if you don't speak to us about the colleagues from, your, from Solidarity Movement, we will tell your wife and your kids that you're a faggot, uh, and we will tell it in, in the work. Nobody will want to work with you anymore. You will be fired, you won't, be, you, uh, you won't find uh, another job, etc. etc. Was it likely or not? Few people tried, you know. So that's why the Solidarity Movement decided uh, to exclude 
queer people from, uh, from its members. Sort of the same thing happened as, as I was studying uh, Michel Foucault's biography, um, because Michel Foucault was convinced, convinced once by Gilles Deleuze uh, to join the Communist Party. Foucault's ideas were not really communist, but Deleuze convinced Foucault that um, Communist uh, Party is the only place where queer people can have an expression. You won't have them with the gold, you won't have them with any other political force. The only force that is actually interested in you and offers you uh, some kind of support is going to be the uh, Communist Party. And what Foucault experienced was completely uh, the opposite. Um, uh, he, he, he first heard that uh, you, you have to hush uh, uh, your homosexual tendencies. Um, if, you, if you're really a communist, you can't be queer, etc. etc. These things that, um, in the, that was in the 60s. And Foucault left the Communist Party uh, after two years and um, was always, always uh, an enemy of the Communist uh, Party. So um, if right now we discuss Foucault as a left wing intellectual, we, we must know that he was anti Marxist, he was anti communist, so that he offers actually a sort of third way to reconsider pretty much, because I think that right now many of our cultures should reconsider actually a third left way, uh, which is, which is you know, outside the specter of 19th century concepts such as Marxism and capitalism. Like, if we want to uh, really rejuvenate, uh, renovate left thinking, we, we, we should quit the old ways, okay? And Foucault might be one of the answers. I'm not saying the only one. But uh, if, if, we, if you want to look for it, then we can. And obviously Foucault, uh, Foucault's uh, thinking offers some ways for the inclusion of uh, homosexuality because Foucault obviously himself was queer. Um, back to college literature, okay? So, so the same thing happened uh, in, in France, same thing happened in, uh, in, in the Solidarity Movement and it marked also, in a way, not only the marriage with the Catholic Church but also it marked in a way uh, the thinking of the people who back then in the times were sort of 30, now they are 70, right? Um, and they still live they still leave uh, the, the same conflicts as they did uh, when they were young. So for them, uh, the, the alternative is you're communist if you're not Christian or okay, Catholic, right? or if you're if if, if um, and if you're um, Catholic, you're, you can't be gay. Okay, so you can't be gay and belong to the opposition. So meaning, uh, if if you want to uh, support gay rights, you're actually a post-communist, which is completely absurd because as I'm trying to show you, uh, communism in Poland was never pro-gay, okay? Neither anywhere. Um, so, so this, this, I'm trying to analyze this, uh, this sort of Polish pulp complex, okay? Which is quite complicated. Um, so, um, I, I mentioned uh, these two novels, uh, three novels, uh, Grzegorz Musiał and Jerzy Andrzejewski's pulp, as an example of this pink-washing politics. Uh, the drama that I mentioned, the war of Prada, is another example of it. Um, and there is one more example which is quite interesting, and it's, uh, it's a novel, short novel by uh, um, Maria Frankowski called Rudolf. Maria Frankowski was a Polish uh, writer and a prisoner of uh, Auschwitz camp, not as a Jew but as a Pole. Um, he survived the camp and decided to <coughs> exile in Belgium. However, he was publishing in Belgium on exile in Polish and also in French, but he was one of those exiled writers who wanted to speak to his native public, so he made some kind of deals or concessions or whatever uh, with the communist authorities. So he, he was invited to Poland and he was publishing things in Poland, but not everything he wanted to publish. So in 1980, uh, uh, 81, um, he presented a novel called Rudolf uh, to publish publishing houses and for a moment it was uh, not available for publication and suddenly uh, on the wake of this washing as I call it uh, movement the novel is allowed the novel is translated to English uh, and there is a French version also I don't know if it's available in Italian um, basically it tells a story of a Polish professor in, somewhere in Belgium who meets a German guy, very elegant, etc., somewhere in the 
70s. Um, they are both, they have their age, okay? And uh, they, they start talking. And the, uh, when the German elegant man learns that uh, his interlocutor is Polish, he starts um, having these uh, memories uh, from German uh, occup Nazi occupation of Poland, which in his case uh, is a story of uh, absolutely best sexual life of, uh, he ever had. Uh, so the story is what, what he's telling the, 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 the Polish professor, who was a camp, um, <coughs> concentration camp uh, prisoner, is how the German officer I don't think I can use this F word. So I had sex with so many Polish boys, okay? Like with this one, with this one. This this boy came when I was uh, doing him um, uh, on, um, in, the, in, the, in the concentration camp, etc. Et uh, completely uh, adverse story to the typical Polish uh, martyrological memory, right? So this novel was very provocative and it still is. Um, <clears throat> but. Um, the thing is that uh, it was allowed with all those sexist description of ejaculations, etc., etc., and uh, the figure of German forcing Polish, forcing maybe not, because the, the, the problem with <laughs> with Bankowski is that the, those boys are not raped, okay? They, they actually want to have sex with the German soldier. This is the biggest problem to digest for, uh, for Polish consciousness. Um, that uh, Because if we discuss um, women who prostituted themselves in uh, concentration camps, they could have been absolved by Polish culture if uh, they didn't want to. But if they did that for privileges in the concentration camp, like for more bread, etc., after war they were sort of um, treated uh, uh, as traitors. This could have been the only way to survive, obviously. But no, because you know, the Polish consciousness is quite uh, high morals uh, and heroic. Okay, everyone should be a hero. They're not like a Czech, Czech culture where you, where you have this acceptance towards um, that you can uh, be afraid. Okay, in post country accounts, <laughs> so you have to be a hero or die. So it's so so what we were saying was quite provocative that, that there were boys who wanted to prostitute themselves. Uh, prostitute. Have sex, okay, for many reasons, with, with German soldiers. And the vision of Second World War, uh, which is a huge massacre, obviously, and a hecatomb for, for, for Polish culture, presented as a ceaseless, never ending sexual adventure, was obviously quite provocative. And in the most um, com compelling scene, um, the German officer shows a tattoo. Oh, uh, of, 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 of a boy that he used to have, okay, let's say. And uh, so the, the, the Polish professor, it, and it all happens in Belgium, in Brussels, in a cafe, shows his tattoo from Auschwitz, okay? So it's like a duel of two tattoos. Uh, something that you did for pleasure and something that was done to you, not out of pleasure, not, not, not out of your will. Um, and apparently this could be seen as a gesture succumbing uh, to Polish dominant consciousness, but it's not. Um, it shows the theatricality uh, of, of this gesture, of this duel, um, and, and it also shows that um, perhaps the only way to um, challenge dominant Polish narratives is through sex. The Polish vision of, and, uh, of Second World War and its literature for years and it has been desexualized, which we know from sources, historical sources, was not the case. The, the thing uh, also happens with the memoir from the Warsaw Uprising, which is a text uh, who, for Konaschenti, if you read it uh, be, between the lines, uh, is quite a, quite a queer story uh, where we can wonder if there's one or two male street characters actually depicted. However, nobody noticed that. that, that. So, 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 so the, the Polish consciousness is like um, war was sacred, everything that is sacred uh, cannot be sexual, and even less homosexual. But sexual, not really. I mean, if a Polish uh, poet who fought in the Warsaw Uprising or in the war was married, that, that was okay. But uh, you couldn't 
talk about his sexual life with his wife, okay? Uh, that, for, for instance, before going uh, for the ultimate fight, they had great sex. No, it's actually unacceptable, okay? So this is the kind of concept of Polish culture. Um, so that was the, uh, some part of the 80s, the, the pinkwashing movement, when they tried to manipulate and compensate uh, for, for the martial law and um, mass um, detention and arresting of solidarity movement people, keeping them in prisons, etc. Suddenly you could say, also to the world, look how liberal we are. We have sexually free literature. We, we even are not afraid to discuss Second World War in terms of sexuality. We are not afraid of provocations, okay? We are progressive, actually. And they, they are conservative, etc. So that was a tricky move. Now, uh, mid-80s, 1985, and something very weird happens. You can uh, also watch a movie about that on Netflix. Maybe some of you even uh, have seen it. It's called Kiatsan. Have you seen it? Yeah. Well, you can. You, you can because it's available uh, between the whole uh, Netflix community. <laughs> um, and it's a good movie. Even though it has some historical inaccuracies, which I pointed, but, but they are relevant rather to Polish audiences and our historical consciousness, uh, not for the outside world, uh, because you can understand basically the concept of what, what it was like to be young uh, in mid 80s and queer. Okay? Um, so the Hyacinth action, Hyacinth is deriving from uh, Zeus's lover, uh, or Apollo, sorry, Apollo's lover. Um, uh, which became then, uh, when he was dead, he became a flower, Hyacinth. Um, so the action Hyacinth was, uh, and Hyacinth was a code name, just as Ganymedes, etc., etc., uh, for, for, for queer people. Um, it was an action of Secret Service in uh, November uh, of 1885, when during a weekend, three days, uh, suddenly uh, secret agents uh, went to queer people places, houses they knew, and also the cruising places, and they arrested them, hundreds of them, all around the country, and kept them at the Millis stations. I'm saying Millis because we didn't have police back then. It was called Millis. Um, and they were arrested, and they were interrogated, and they were um, asked and forced to give more and more and more names. So uh, we know that there was at least 11,000 files from that uh, action, but only recently did we learn that, uh, as a matter of fact, Communist uh, Secret Service uh, had several lists of queer people starting from the 50s. So they were sort of renovating their files uh, again and again, but this was the, the only one it was repeated also two times, so twice. So it was in 85, 87, and 88. Um, nobody knows the purpose of this, uh, of this action, secret service action, because they already had some lists. They, you can say they wanted more. They were saying that it's because um, that it's because of the spread of HIV pandemic that they need to be prepared if, some, if there's a ma major break of pandemic uh, to, to, to know to whom go to, okay? This is something similar like the, the current Polish government tries to make a list of people who are pregnant, of women who are pregnant right now just in order to, you know, know the dangers of, uh, of the pregnancy but uh, knowing that they are so much against abortion uh, it seems that they are trying to follow who might have uh, committed an illegal abortion. You know, so, so, you know, um, you, you explain yourself with goodwill, but you don't, you don't have a goodwill. Okay. Um, um, so, so that was one of the explanations that it was uh, run against HIV pandemic. But um, mm, it seems more probable that it was an, that it was a reaction toward. The, um, birth of first Polish LGBT, uh, LGB, or maybe LG actually, because back then people didn't discuss bisexuality or trans, rather. Even 
even though one person from Solidarity Movement uh, famously became a, a trans woman, known to, to her colleagues back then uh, as a man, uh, now is a, as an opponent of a, and a trans person, a whole But like, like a digression. So, so uh, back to the issue. So um, there were attempts to create first queer organizations. There were um, unofficial zines uh, copied on illegal machines, printing machines. Uh, these zines actually did not contain anything politically subversive, let's say. It, it did contain information about HIV and how to use condoms, for instance, which then contradicts the idea that uh, the authorities wanted to um, shelve HIV outbreak. Uh, if they try to also block the publication of materials that could act, uh, eventually lead. Another thing is that Sweden sent, uh, some, in mid 80s, uh, condoms were hardly available actually in uh, communist Poland. I mean, in mid 80s, uh, everything was hardly uh, available. Toilet paper, for instance. That was, I, I, I don't know if you saw that in, in Poland, but people who, uh, who managed to buy toilet paper were uh, having it like a um, wearing it on their necks and walking the streets, you know, as if it was a laurel um, uh, given to a, a national poet, you know, they were supporting this uh, kind of toilet, toilet paper that, that was very successful. Also, there was no, um, <clears throat> there was no, um, like it was difficult to have a, um, a bag, uh, like a supermarket bag, so, so people who had uh, family in, in the UK, for instance, they received uh, Tesco bags, you know, and they were wearing them on the streets and, like, like, you know, bragging them as if they were uh, dandies, you know, the, the, you, 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 you were showing yourself with a Tesco bag. This says, I think, quite a lot about the situation in the country. So, condoms neither, okay? And Sweden thought, um, they were sort of clever, okay? Everyone understood, I think, outside the Soviet bloc that um, if it's a pandemic, we know that right now very well, if it's a pandemic, borders won't stop it. It will, would come eventually. We have to help the others whose authorities don't understand or don't want to understand. So they sent a plane or a ship, I don't remember exactly right now, with tons of condoms to Poland. However, instead of being grateful, the Polish authorities uh, destroy those condoms. So this is their idea of prevention of HIV, right? So this contradicts the idea that Hyatt's action was taken to prevent it. There was a nascent uh, political LGBTQ movement uh, and the first organization, unofficial obviously because they, can't, they couldn't legalize it, was called uh, Warszawski Ruch Homosexualny, Warsaw Homosexual Movement, 1987. But the zines were published from, uh, um, from 81, 82, and uh, one of, um, one of um, Polish, um, let's say, contacts was a, uh, was a man, Andrzej Sadarowicz, who emigrated in the 70s to Austria, to Vienna, and he became a member of HOSI. HOSI was a, an Austrian organization, homosexual organization, um, and uh, so he was a member and he was like the delegate for Central Europe, especially Poland. So they had contacts. The communist authorities understood that perversely that there is something like a, <clears throat> like, 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 like a queer international movement, just as a socialist international movement. Um, and it, 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 it wants to invade also their impermeable boundaries uh, of socialist countries, okay? So that, in fact, Andrzej Sawarowicz is an agent of secret service of a different country because he already had an Austrian citizenship. So a citizen from a, citizen from a alien country is trying to um, Perfect. Perfect, yes. 
Yes, <laughs> that always. <laughs> uh, make a hole and pass something bad, okay? Perforate, okay? Um, the condom of Polish culture, let's say. <laughs> um, so, um, the, of, of communist uh, country. Um, and so that, that, that was the story. Now, how much time do we have? Um, we have a, a sound, sound still, right? So what, yeah. what time is it? Yeah, so, so, so um, mm, before the questions, I, I didn't arrive at the most contemporary literature, but I think this is actually interesting because it shows uh, where we come from. So in 1990s, um, everything is now legal. You can, if you want to, you can have a gay magazine. And we did. It was called Inache from 1990. Uh, Inache meaning something like differently, in other way. It was a code word for, for, for being queer. Um, like in an alternative manner, it could be said, th things like that, okay? So, you know, and, and it, it ran for 12, uh, for 11 years, this magazine. Then we have uh, the legal organization Lambda. We had uh, subsequently campaign against homophobia, legalized, etc., etc. However, literature, not really. Uh, in, the, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, three, four novels were published and two novels in major publishing houses by writers who were rather old, but basically young people published a few novels, but these novels were published in public, uh, not, not, not public, but private uh, publishing houses, and they were never really sold, neither reviewed, okay, so, so the mainstream criticism uh, did not notice them at all. They were only noticed by the commercial public, so, so people like, uh, you know, they were using this, this concept of saying to, to the year, have you heard that there is this novel, it's called that, 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 and if you go to that bookshop, they, they can sell it to you, okay, so, so this is how it, uh, sold it. We, we, we know about these novels. Um, and these novels, um, show something like they discuss actually not what is happening right now, but they rather discuss the uh, experience of communism. Um, and apparently, we learned that they were all written in the 80s or even 70s in some cases, um, but they were not allowed to be published officially in the last years of communism because there was no place for pink washing at that moment. Um, it's, it's, so they created a new kind of gay identity uh, in Polish literature, which is similar in all those novels, but uh, it's a version of gay identity based on victimization, uh, auto-victimization. Like, you, you always play the victim. All these uh, uh, characters in these novels uh, deal with boys, that they are of a certain age, they are, they are never young. So they all, all have to deal with uh, young boys who prostitute themselves and eventually rob them because um, obviously a young boy would never sleep with a 30-something-year-old man uh, without being paid uh, or, uh, or living um, in his place, if he's homeless, etc. You know, this kind of thinking. So that, uh, the vision was that um, young people only prostitute and only people of certain age can have a gay identity but they hate themselves. So they are all alcoholic. They all have suicidal thoughts, and um, uh, almost all of them uh, have a suicide, suicide uh, attempt or some friend. Um, and these novels seem so uh, similar in this respect. One of them only uh, is a bit different. It was written by, by Martin Krzysztof. It's called the title actually suggests this uh, victimization move. It's called Bulisnienia, the pain of existence. Uh, but it's not a sad novel. Um, he was younger than the others. He was born in 65, and the novel was written in around 87, so he was 22. He was a student of Russian philology. Um, and then in 1990, he became <coughs> an editor for the magazine Inache, as I said. And the, the magazine Inache published his novel, Pain of Existence. Uh, and this novel is set in the 80s, and um, it shows queer life of uh, young adults, like, like t teenagers and people who are less than 30, who try to organize themselves into a web of solidarity against the regime, but also uh, try to organize um, a homosexual movement. 
uh, um, um, and they, they don't want to play victims. They, there is awareness that some of our friends commit suicide because they can't uh, stand another bashing, like being beaten by a group of Nazi-like uh, adversaries, etc., etc. Uh, so, so it is in the horizon we have it, but <clears throat> but, but then it, it, the whole um, character, uh, this boy, is actually enjoying his sexual life and trying to make a sort of, let's say, normal living, actually even with, with having lots of fun, um, fooling around with, with boys, becoming friends, sharing the love. The practice was that uh, you didn't, you, you, you usually didn't owe <laughs> Your, your couple, you could, um, you, you knew somebody, you had their phone number, so you, you met somebody else, you liked them, you gave them the number of the different person, etc., etc. So it seems like a um, different vision of the 80s. But that was uh, the vision of the 80s of the younger generation. This novel is interesting, but the author of it, uh, of it um, hates it for some reason. He says that it was naive. He was naive. Um, um, he published many of his poems in that novel. He says that these poems are mm, sort of banal um, and actually of a very naive person, so, so he despises this novel and uh, he never wants to have any discussions about that. But it, this novel is uh, still and still coming back in uh, queer uh, research because it is indispensable. And now, to, make, to cut the long story short, uh, actually, that was the beginning of the 90s, and we had nothing <laughs> almost until uh, in 1995, Isabella Filipia. Right now, Isabella Moska publishes, um, as you can see, all that was male literature. Publishes Absoluta Amnesia, which is, uh, in my opinion, the best uh, published novel of a young generation from the 90s. It's an absolute amnesia, an absolute amnesia. And it's a feminist uh, story and a lesbian story, uh, which becomes a huge scandal discussed all the time. Uh, major male critics hate it. Uh, no problem. And um, um, but, 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 but that's, uh, that happens before she actually comes out. In 1998, uh, she's invited to a talk show uh, on the television. And I don't remember exactly, I've never seen this uh, emission, I only read about it. Uh, but either she goes with her current girlfriend, either she comes out on, uh, on, on the telly. And this is actually the first, uh, let's say, postmodern coming out of a public person, a writer, in this context. Uh, and, it, and it's Isabella Filipe, Isabella Mosca, uh, who later published many <coughs> very interesting uh, books. However, she's not translated into any language aside from Italian. <laughs> because uh, no, unfortunately, not, not her novels, but her poems. I mean, that's okay, the poems are okay. I'm saying that the novels are very important and they should be. Alessandra Menta translated uh, the poems, uh, Madame Intuita. Uh, so, Madame Intuita means uh, that uh, it, it's, it's an ironic version of, uh, of a woman. Intuita means uh, who is led. She's, she's, a, she's a passive, she's not the agent. She's not the one who is in, uh, intuiting, leading somewhere. She's the one who is led. This is, this is an ironic version of um, Pan Cogito um, from Zbigniew Herbert's poetry, Pan Cogito, uh, Mr. Cogito, Mr. I think, okay, Mr. I think. Uh, and then you have a lady who is led, and, the, and this is ironic. So it is available in Italian, it's the only translation, but uh, hopefully there will be more. Great writer, um, and uh, one of uh, really few uh, voices, uh, lesbian voices in Polish literature. And in 2004, Michał Witkowski publishes his novel Lugiewo, which is translated in, um, as sometimes uh, originally as Lugiewo, sometimes as Love Town. Uh, this is the English translation, but uh, also the Spanish translation is Love Town. And it's been translated to uh, some 20 uh, languages. So, is it translated to Italian? Yes, yeah. yeah, that also. I'm not surprised. So, uh, 2004, and this is a postmodern uh, novel. However, it incorporates the story of the 80s in a new way uh, because it shows two old faggots, two old queens, they always uh, call themselves queens and this is politically incorrect, but they did that. Uh, well, 
that very old, meaning 50, okay? Because, you know, queer, queer, queer men are sort of um, difficult in that uh, context. Isn't that? You're old when you're uh, 40 plus, okay? Uh, so, so they are very old, and uh, they uh, try to remember the heyday of, uh, of, of the peak of their uh, sexual life, which happened to be in the 80s, and how they uh, went to have sex with Russian soldiers. So as you can see, this is kind of a repetition of the concept of Rudolf, when uh, a German soldier had sex with Polish boys, and now Polish boys went to Russia because the Russian army in all the Soviet bloc had its uh, camps. Well, that was one of the ways they uh, executed their dominance. Okay? Um, but the, those soldiers were sort of apparently uh, sex hungry because all, all male uh, environment. So uh, Polish queens apparently dressed up as ladies and went uh, to, to, to have sex with those Russian soldiers. Uh, and apparently those Russian soldiers never realized that they were actually men. The, the, the whole story is sort of a fantasy, rather, probably. <laughs> Maybe something of that was connected to reality, but pr probably it's rather, you know, like, hyper... Uh, um, uh, hyperbolized, okay? Um, uh, like, sort of, sort of a sexual fantasy of having sex with your enemy, okay? Um, but basically this is what they are remembering, this is the first part of the novel, and the second part of the novel is a postmodern novel cut into short pieces, short chapters, uh, which happens uh, in Poland by the Baltic Sea, uh, in a town called uh, uh, Lugiewo, this is the title, uh, and it's a gay and nudist beach where postmodern gays meet and Cruise basically, and it shows sort of sort of the problems uh, of queer community uh, at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, and this is a novel that um, I think I should be finishing quite soon. But this is a novel that changed our uh, queer literature, and from now on, we have uh, an enormous wave. Like we have literally uh, one uh, each month, we have at least two or three books published right now. Uh, with queer content, we have a, an abundance, uh, whatever you want. You want a criminal story with gay characters, you have it. You want children literature, you have it. If there is time uh, on another occasion, I might talk about it if, if you're interested, because I think that the queer literature uh, for, for children topic is um, quite interesting. Um, if you want gay poetry, you have it. You know, you, you, you have it all. You, have a, you, you, you want a simple romance, you have it. You want bisexual problems, you have it. You want a transgender person uh, coming of age novel, you have it, etc. etc. So, so you, you, we, we have everything. The problem is, most of these books, if you apply uh, not the pleasure criteria, but the sort of high art criteria, are not really good. Um, they are rather pulp. So we have a proliferation of queer narrative, out of which like 80% is you know something that you read and you don't remember the next day. You know, you, you know and, and uh, the style sometimes it, it also has to do something with self-publishing. There is a self-publishing house in Poland which specializes in queer literature, uh, which I actually sell because um, even though Polish uh, people don't read, <laughs> rather. Like, re really, I, I, I've noticed that in France people read more, in, in Spain people read more, so I assume that possibly uh, people also read more than Polish people, because people don't read. But, uh, but if, um, if you want to sell a book, it has to be sort of, kind of dedicated to a target, and uh, a queer community became this target, okay? So, uh, if you write something for queer community, you're sure that you'll sell. Because there is a new readership, new a group of people who will buy almost anything, provided it has gay content. Okay? This is also sort of a bubble problem that we experience. This is a long discussion that we could have, but like the bubbles that are created by uh, social media, that we uh, close ourselves in certain bubbles and we don't want to go out. So, so there is a bubble of people who won't read anything. If it does not have a gay character, so they are not interested in literature per se, they are interested in repeating stories about themselves. 
which is a double-edged phenomenon because on the one side we always wanted this kind of literature, we needed it um, to, and we didn't have it as a sort of a role model, etc. etc. But now um, we are stuck as in a ghetto and we read only over and over the same sort of gay story again and again and, again, and nothing else. Some of us, I mean. Maybe some somebody who is doing literature at the university. No, 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 but I'm simple readers, right? So this is an interesting phenomenon to, to analyze, and uh, I try to talk about it without too many names. Uh, however, if if you want some of the name, probably is not much of it is translated. Anyway, if if, if you need some names, uh, just come to me and I will give it uh, to you. I try to stick rather to concepts and uh, clarify the situation um, in a way that uh, is understandable outside our Polish ghetto context, okay? And uh, I hope I succeeded and I'm very, uh, in the last words, I'm very pleased that so many of you appeared uh, and actually seemed to be listening to, <laughs> to, to, to me uh, actively, uh, which is, um, you know, at the Polish academy of sciences we don't teach. Uh, we just, just do research, but I love teaching. I, I, I didn't get up uh, because I have to use the microphone, but my, 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 my style when I teach is rather that I like peripatetic style, like <laughs> walking and uh, dancing and doing shows and singing songs, etc. Et et so you didn't have that because of the microphone. Um, but um, still, I think I managed to keep your attention, uh, which is very pleasing for me and uh, you know um, I, I long for having classes so, so, so I, I got the feedback I needed um, uh, pretty much uh, from the audience so thank you very much thank you
Uh, so you could choose, as, as in a supermarket, which version you want. Uh, you don't have to pass through the sequence time. Um, and there was this gender ideas, and, and um, many feminists didn't have this um, prejudice against uh, lesbian women, which was uh, the US. Uh, there is an HBO series, I don't know if you remember, if you've seen it, I forgot the title, it's about Gloria Steinem and all this movement of, 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 of feminists. And uh, Gloria Steinem was not against lesbians, but um, um, the lady who wrote Feminine Mystique was called. Uh, but the book shows the dominant uh, U.S. Uh, feminist, and she, she sort of was hesitant about including lesbians of uh, showing off uh, lesbians in the uh, feminist movement because she, she thought that they do a uh, do bad job to the image of feminists, etc. We, in our case, anything connected to gender was already bad job, so, so there was no good no job. So, and it all sort of was used interchangeably. Gay studies were mixed already with queer studies in our context. It all came and mixed uh, in, 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 in some ways, and we did not simply adopt uh, the ideas and concepts, but we sort of mm, sort of used some of them with, without some implications, and also uh, added some of our own local flavor, let's say. So, so uh, if you want to um, judge from the Anglo-Saxon, Anglosphere perspective, uh, mostly um, our uh, our development of uh, gender queer culture, etc., and studies. It seems like we did it later. The same thing, but it's not true. If you take a closer look, uh, it, it's different, and, and uh, also it's it's mixed. Like Isabella uh, Mosca, that is Isabella Fike, was a major feminist, and she was a student of Maria Janion, who was, who, who was one of the leading Polish literary scholars uh, already in the 50s and 60s and in the 70s she became like the leader of progressive left uh, I will be talking about it uh, in the second lecture uh, <clears throat> group of students um, and in the 80s she was like, like a legend she, and she started feminist thinking but she was also a lesbian that was not really known back then but um, and Isabella Felipe was her student <clears throat> Obviously, uh, Yanin appealed to her, and she is depicted uh, in her novel Absolute Amnesia, absolutely Absolute Amnesia, as like the female role model professor. Isabella Mosca herself is now a professor of uh, American studies. Um, so, the major Polish uh, feminist was lesbian at the same time, um, and there was no, even though there were feminists who were not lesbian, uh, there was no not really a conflict, actually, like 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 it what used to be um, in, in the US or in some other countries, because uh, of the fact that we uh, um, adopted some of these ideas later and in our own way, okay, something like that. I don't know if I answered your question like you wanted, um, but uh, I'll I'll be talking about that a, a bit more uh, in the next class, although also about some other. The things. Mm. Uh, could, I mean, uh, uh, got into the uh, point that uh, you, you told us uh, about this uh, uh, phenomenon of, uh, of uh, a queer uh, children literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, Seen in several cases uh, of uh, you know, sense, well, well, we wouldn't say that it's censorship, but for example, you know, school libraries would not uh, would uh, buy these kind of books, and immediately there would have been some reactions of the right-wing parties, and it's immoral, uh, teaching gender you know, to, to kids, and so on and so on. And, and as long as I know the political situation is controlled, it's Quite, it's even worse. Mm -hmm. So uh, how how is it that you have got this kind of uh, widespread uh, queer children literature, whereas I mean, it, for sure it's not supported by by by, by, by the government or by, by political issues, but still uh, you, you see mm -hmm. 
Because we, uh, as a nation, as a, as a culture, being for years uh, in a sort of colonial relation to the others, okay, one thing, uh, not only communism, but also before, problem was divided uh, between Austria, Russia, and Russia, um, who were imposing their cultures as um, more important and more dominant. Uh, we had this uh, thing, uh, which is special, especially in Italy, I don't know, uh, uh, that what is official, we ignore. Okay. So if you, <laughs> so if it's in the, uh, in the, in the at schools, it's less interesting than something that is not available at schools. If it's uh, not in um, school libraries, then people look for it uh, and they actually read it instead of reading what is uh, taught at school. So this is exaggerated, but in a way, this is this is what actually we do. If something is prohibited or something is bad thing, then 100 percent is going to be interesting. When in 2007, a Polish minister of education around uh, Yeti tried to <coughs> um, uh, block the presence of Witold Kompromis, our major queer writer, major writer per se, but also a queer writer at schools. Uh, suddenly, the publishing houses uh, increased the numbers of copies sold like three or four times. Okay, so, 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 so you, you see, we are <laughs> we are not obedient. <laughs> we we, we do things. You know, uh, I'm like that uh, as well. So, so, so if somebody tells me to do something, I probably won't. <laughs> so <laughs> if tries, somebody tries to force me to do something, um, I, I became interested in the Wojcicki because it was not really. Um, presented as, the, as a major poet uh, at school. It was like presented as a kind of a weirdo uh, that you have to discuss because he existed. However, you know, the other poetry is more interesting. So obviously I became interested in Bielowski and I went to, to, uh, to, to a like, public library and I borrowed a book of Bielowski and I learned, uh, as I told you yesterday, I, I, I read <clears throat> his, his poems about uh, his problem issues with false teeth falling out and I thought to myself, this is poetry. This is poetry, not what they put at the at school, it's not what they show you officially. It is official, it's always suspicious for us. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's why the success of uh, queer notes. And they are pretty needed actually, because the percentage of uh, queer youth suicides in Poland is the highest in Europe, I think. If there are any questions, uh, some of you um, I will I'll meet. Yes? Well, well, hopefully, all of them. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Hopefully, all of them at the second floor in the. which is the room of five. I guess it's, it's, it's five. It's here. Next to the room. A spoiler and a teaser, I will take off my red jacket because I don't know if you've seen <laughs> it's, it's warm for people from, from, from the world. I have a t-shirt with Toledo, 